uh, welcome everybody to our uh, Saudi Society of Pediatric Dentistry webinar series. Uh, I am Dr. Daniel Agiri. I'm one of the board members of the SSPD. I'm also um, an associate professor in dental public health in the School of Dentistry at King Abdul Aziz University. And I'm also a pediatric uh, consultant. Today, I would like to welcome all of you to our ninth webinar. And uh, this webinar is organized by the SSPD and by Kunuz Ritaj, our company for um, uh, management uh, of events and communication. This activity is accredited for two hours for active SSPD members and for the other, all the other participants, they will all receive a certificate of uh, attendance. It's my pleasure today to be moderating this session together with my colleague, Dr. Huda Abdul Latif. I'll be moderating the first session and Dr. Huda will be moderating the second session. Dr. Huda Abdul Latif is an associate professor in Princess Noura University in Riyadh. She is also an adjunct professor in the University of AM in Texas College of Dentistry. Uh, welcome, Dr. Huda. I'm very happy that you'll be helping me in moderating this session. Um, Dr. Huda and I will be hosting uh, today two distinguished speakers, Professor Paul Ashley and Dr. Susan Parekh. Our first speaker this evening is Professor Paul Ashley. Professor Paul Ashley is the academic lead of pediatric dentistry at UCL Eastman Dental Institute in London. He received his BDS in Manchester in 1991 and completed his PhD in 1997 and has been working in UCL Eastman Dental Institute since 1998. His research interests include caries management, oral health in sport, and evidence-based dentistry. Professor Ashley will be speaking today about fluoride and its role in caries, uh, dental caries uh, prevention. We will be hosting Q&A at the end of his talk, uh, so please write all your questions in the question and answer section of this uh, platform, and we'll be uh, doing this right at the end of the talk. Without further ado, please welcome Professor Ashley. So thank you very much for your very kind uh, invitation uh, and uh, for a very well organized seminar as well, I think. As a society, it really feels like you're leading the way um, uh, almost across the world for, for this sort of thing. Um, and I'm hoping everyone can see my presentation now. And I'm going to talk for the next 35, 40 minutes um, about prevention and fluoride. And I put my email at the bottom there. Um, some of you will hopefully know me because I'm hoping some of our former students will be will be listening. Um, those of you that don't know me, uh, within reason, feel free to, to send me an email afterwards um, if there's anything that I really don't cover at all. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about why fluoride um, and prevention is important. We're going to touch on what fluoride is and think a little bit about what the risks are. And then we'll finish really with the evidence-based methods to prevent um, dental disease uh, with fluoride and think about community interventions and think about interventions for individuals. And at the end, obviously, we've got some Q&A. This talk... Um, Inevitably, is a little bit from a UK perspective because obviously that's what I know, but uh, I've tried to uh, think about your own uh, needs. Um, and I think I'll say thank you now to one of our current students, um, Hassan Jamal, who's been very helpful in, in helping me to understand some of the particular nuances um, that, that, that affect you as a, as a society. So the first thing is thinking about why it's important. Um, and it's important because care is a, is a massive problem. And it's a global problem. We know that the UK is common human diseases um, out there. But it's a really big problem as well um, for, for Saudi. So Hassan um, passed on these two reviews to me. The first is a, a paper comparing urban and rural children and, and DFT and caries levels. The other is a systematic review. And if I kind of lean forward and I peer at the screen, um, I can remind myself that your caries prevalence is almost 86, 87%. Um, in a six-year-old. So you've got lots of dental disease um, uh, in your child population. And of course, the current pandemic just really makes everything much worse because uh, obviously, historically, if somebody has a hole in their teeth, they come in, you give them a filling, um, you send them home, bang, all, all done. But 
that's complicated now. Um, anything involving drilling um, uh, is technically an AGP, so that means you need that extra little layer of, of PPE. And obviously this will go away, this, this situation will get better at some point, but that's, that might not be this side of Christmas, that might not be this side of summer next year. So, so care is, is, is a really huge problem. And the temptation, uh, or what happens is, is what public health people call a, a downstream approach, you know? So there's, a, there's something called the river parable, which is where um, somebody is walking by a river and they see drowning people going by and they pull the drowning people out and they keep pulling the drowning people out. But the point is, well, why are you pulling the drowning people out when you go up the river? and figure out where they're falling in. And, and, and really, we tend to be, in dentistry, we tend to focus a little bit too much probably on downstream approaches. We're, we're technical people. We like doing things, we like fixing things, you know? So um, we're, we're almost trained to, to repair holes in teeth, but it'd be much better to stop the holes from happening at all. And that's where perhaps as a profession globally, I don't think we are perhaps as good as we could be. And there are lots of different approaches for prevention, but, However you look at it, fluoride is probably still the cornerstone, probably still the most effective method we have at preventing dental disease um, in children. So because it's our most effective tool, it's really important that we understand what it is. It's really important we understand how it works. Um, and then we can think about risks and then we can think about evidence-based use. So let's start off with that. What exactly is fluoride and how does it work? Uh, before I do that, um, I think a couple of documents I want to highlight. The first is Delivering Better Oral Health. Um, it's a Public Health England document for English dentists, but I think it is a really lovely example of um, evidence-based interventions, you know? So you may not want to do what it says because you don't live in England, you, you live somewhere else. But when you look at the um, uh, advice they give, there's a very clear line back to what the evidence is. So I think it's a really nice toolkit and, and hopefully you would look at it if you haven't seen it before and lift out the bits that you think are, are relevant. I think the other really useful document is the Scottish SDSEP guidance called Prevention and Management of Dental Carriers in Children. Again, uh, designed uh, by Scotland for Scotland, but actually this document does have real global reach. You know, um, I think a lot of countries around the world, again, lift elements of it. Again, really clear line from the evidence right through to the, uh, the intervention. Again, parts of it may not suit you, may not suit your society, but elements of it I think are useful. And in terms of a reference source, um, it's freely available um, and I think it's useful. So I think before I, I continue, I think just I wanna highlight these two, um, these two manuals. Okay, what is fluoride? Fluoride is a naturally, a naturally occurring element. Um, and you find trace quantities everywhere. You find them in soil, you find them in water, plants, animals. Okay, and it's this very odd looking um, yellow crystal. All right, so it's very commonly found. And since about the 1800s, we've known that it can have a role in caries prevention, with most of the important work being done in America by people like H. Trinley Dean, et cetera, which initially led to water fluoridation. So it works, well, it's really got three modes of action. The first is that it will inhibit demineralization, okay? The second is that it will enhance remineralization. And then the third is that it will inhibit plant bacteria, okay? And the reason that the third is in slightly smaller text is because that's the least significant, it's the less significant of, of, of the modes of action. Okay, so how does it inhibit demin? Well, if you have an acid attack, if you have something with sugar in um, and your plant pH drops, you'll get fluoride ions released um, into the biofilm, into the plant, into the saliva. And this fluoride will adsorb, yes? Yeah? So that's A-D-S-O-R-B, it's not a spelling mistake. And what we mean by adsorb is it kind of sticks to the surface, but doesn't actually go into the tooth. So it absorbs the enamel crystal surface and it protects it. And that then leads on to the second mechanism of fluoride is the enhancement of remineralization. So hopefully you can see my mouse whizzing around here. So we have our partially demineralized surface, our negative fluoride ions adsorb onto that surface. These negative ions attract positive calcium ions, yeah? 
and you end up with a surface that's remineralized. Um, and actually what happens is during this cycle, you get more uh, um, fluoride incorporated as well, which then makes the surface more resistant to further demineralization. So this demin remin cycle is really the main method by which fluoride works. And right off, you can see that for fluoride to work in this way, it has to be present in the mouth. Okay, it can't be, uh, uh, there's no point swallowing it. All right, so, um, and this is a point we'll pick up later. We now know, we now believe that almost all of fluoride's mode of action um, is topical. Um, and there's not much point having um, fluoride internally because it's not going to do very much there. Final mode of action is inhibiting plant bacteria. Uh, what's meant to happen there is you're going to drop in pH. That leads to HF formation. Um, this diffuses across the bacterial cell wall and it will disrupt essential enzyme function. Uh, I think this happens, but I think most people believe that it's really this demon remin this um, the way it affects that demon remin cycle that you get the critical the critical changes. So fluoride most effective topically. Most effective if present at constant low concentrations in the oral cavity. Dose dependent, yeah. So the higher the dose, as long as you're not going to poison someone, the more effect you will get. Right. So it's important we understand that because that will then feed into how we prescribe fluoride. And it's important we understand that, like I say, the notion of systemic fluoride, of swallowing fluoride, that doesn't really um, apply anymore. Okay, so that's what fluoride is. Um, that's how it works. I think the next thing to consider, uh, what are the risks from fluoride? Because obviously, if we're going to use it to prevent all these caries, we need to understand what can go wrong. And classically, when people talk about risks for fluoride, they firstly talk about acute risks. Uh, and this is the notion that if you have too much toothpaste or if you swallow a bottle of fluoride tablets, you might somehow poison yourself. And certainly when I used to teach this or when I do teach this as part of um, our uh, master's program, as part of our doctorate program, um, I used to spend quite a bit of time talking about these different levels, five milligrams of fluoride per kilo, body weight was probably toxic, 16 to 64 milligrams uh, fluoride per kilo body weight, certainly lethal, but I've kind of stopped now because the reality is that um, I've not found or I'm not aware of any case reports ever of anyone uh, poisoning themselves either um, significantly or lethally with fluoride from a dental course, okay? So you can find uh, uh, factory workers who've poisoned themselves from fluoride because they're using it in a factory setting to, to make glass or something, um, but you don't find it um, in, in, in a normal home setting. So even though we have these values, the reality is that's probably not going to happen. Yeah, You're not going to uh, get someone poisoned by fluoride in that way. The same goes for the myriad of health conditions that are linked to excess fluoride, you know, by the, the kind of anti-fluoridation uh, group. And you've got everything from cancer to HIV to Down syndrome. Um, and again, absolutely no evidence that um, any of these things call, are caused by excess fluoride. Um, and in general, the, the studies are very poor. But there are two areas of risk with fluoride. One of them, fluorosis you will know about, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the other one that sometimes gets missed a little bit is skeletal fluorosis. And it is possible if you consume too much fluoride to get skeletal fluorosis. Uh, and the reason uh, I talk about this is that in the UK, um, several years ago, we introduced um, high strength fluoride toothpaste. Um, so the standard in the UK now is 1000 ppm, then 1400 ppm, and then you might go up to 2800 ppm, and then you finish at 5000 ppm. 5000 ppm is usually um, 16 years and up, 2800 ppm is usually 10 years and up. Um, and when this happened, I was contacted by the uh, agency responsible for uh, new medicines in the UK because they'd found um, uh, two cases of skeletal fluorosis as a result of excess fluoride toothpaste exposure. So in both cases, the individuals have been consuming in excess of 50 milligrams of fluoride a day. So that's quite a lot. Um, and that's because basically these guys were, were brushing their teeth up to 18 times a day. So really abnormal behavior. Um, and they were presenting with joint pain because they had a skeletal fluorosis. And once they'd uh, stopped brushing their teeth 18 times a day, they got better because obviously the bone is constantly turning over. So it's very difficult to do this 
with an ordinary fluoride toothpaste. The reason I was contacted is because if you look at the 5,000 ppm, if you abuse that, you maybe might get close to a skeletal fluorosis. Um, uh, but, but I think it's important to note that this is a known side effect from fried toothpaste, albeit an uncommon one. The one that is common uh, and that we worry about, that perhaps not so much anymore, is dental fluorosis. So on the right, you can see two examples. The top picture, you can see that papery whiteness, and that's the classic for, for a mild type fluorosis. And then the bottom picture, you can see a slightly more severe fluorosis, and that's that papery whiteness, but with this brown hyperplasia made at the top. Fluorosis is a mineralization defect of enamel from too much fluoride. You get this subsurface porosity below a well mineralized surface zone. Only happens if you've got teeth that are developing, so only will affect teeth in the early maturation stage. So that's why really we are not worried so much about fluoride dose over the age of six, because by then most of your teeth have developed. Um, but we are a little bit worried perhaps under the age of six. Um, and the way it works, it's this constant low exposure to fluoride. So it's not as if you have a, a threshold where suddenly one day you'll have a little bit too much fluoride and bang, you'll get fluorosis. It's more constant um, background exposure. Is it a problem? So I'm not going to talk about fluorosis and water fluoridation because that's fairly well recognized. And essentially, if you live in a water, fluoridate, water fluoridated area, you can expect about 1% of your population to, to have some sort of problems. I think the interesting one, though, is fluoride toothpaste. Uh, does fluoride toothpaste cause fluorosis? And the reason why particularly it's interesting for me in the UK is that our advice now, and our advice probably for the last five to 10 years, has been that the lowest dose of fluoride paste is 1,000 ppm. Um, and actually, if you've got a two-year-old or a three-year-old at risk, you can put them up to 1,400 ppm. And for years, we used to give people 250 and 500 ppm, you know, and we'd only go up to 1,400 once someone got past six, and that's all changed now. Um, and so one of the concerns was that we would end up with an epidemic of fluorosis. And the reason that they made the decision to go for 1,000 ppm um, at any age is partly because of this Cochrane review. And what the Cochrane review showed was that there was weak and reliable evidence to show that under 12 months of age, if you had um, uh, fluoride containing toothpaste, you might have an increased risk of fluorosis. Between the ages of 12 to 24, nobody really knew, okay? And above two years of age, there was no evidence at all that fluoride uh, toothpaste um, was associated with fluorosis. And so that's why in the UK, we're pretty much 1,000 ppm across the board, going up to 1,400 and going up to higher than that, um, if you're worried. And actually in the UK now, it's quite hard to find 250 ppm, it's quite hard to find 500 ppm. And you tend to find that you either have everyone on 1,000 or you have the people who don't believe in fluoride for different reasons uh, and you have none at all. So on the whole, I don't think fluorosis and fluoride toothpaste is something perhaps we need to worry about so much. Okay, so that's what fluoride is. That's what the risks are. So I think the next thing to think about and the final bit to think about uh, are really how could we use it? And, and what are the evidence-based methods for, for use of fluoride toothpaste? And we'll touch on community um, interventions. I'm only gonna do one slide on this because really I think, uh, or I feel that what I want to get across to you today is how you can use it uh, in your practices with your, with your patients or what you should be teaching your students if you're teaching students. But if you're looking at community interventions, the classic um, is still water fluoridation. Uh, so America is still about 60% fluoridated. Um, it's probably effective. Okay, though so interestingly, if you look at the quality of the evidence, because it's quite old, um, the evidence doesn't stand up to modern scrutiny. It doesn't mean that water fluoridation doesn't work, but a lot of the evidence, like I say, is from the 60s, from the 70s, and how we look at this now has moved on. The difficulty with water fluoridation, or certainly the difficulty with water fluoridation in the UK, is that politically it is very difficult to get it moving forward. And the minute you talk about water fluoridation, essentially all the uh, kind of crazies come out of woodwork um, and, and start talking about all oh, cancer and all these other sorts of problems. And it's something that really attracts uh, the kind of conspiracy theory uh, um, uh, fringe of the population. Um, and and I, I guess I shouldn't be too dismissive, you know, um, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but politically it makes it really hard because it's much easier 
for people who don't want water fluoridation are usually much more motivated than people who do want water fluoridation. So it's a tough one to get in. The next common community scheme you see is salt fluoridation. Um, again, it works. You put uh, fluoride into salt, and then the idea is that when you're cooking, you use a fluoridated salt rather than ordinary salt. Again, that's a tricky one because uh, nowadays the health message isn't have more salt, it's have less salt, you know, because of the association with blood pressure, etc. Um, and I think it's a real mixed message if you're trying to say, well, use the salt because it's good for your teeth, but then uh, also you'll say, oh, don't use the salt because we're worried about blood pressure. So in the UK, we have kind of defaulted to either school fluoride varnish schemes or supervised toothbrushing schemes, you know? Um, and actually Child Smile, um, who operate in Scotland, are probably the leader in both of these things. Um, and the nice thing about these schemes is they're relatively simple to run. So you don't need a dentist, you can have a therapist or, or a hygienist delivering the varnish components or, or a nurse actually in the UK. Um, you just need a health promotion person delivering the supervised toothbrushing along with the free toothpaste. Um, and the evidence base for both is really, really good. We, we know they both really work. So I'm not gonna to spend too much more time on community-based interventions, but if you're interested, like I say, I think fluoride virus or supervised toothbrushing, certainly in the UK experience, they're the ones to go for because they are, they're relatively straightforward to set up. Okay, but like I say, what we're really interested in, what I'm really interested in talking about is what we can do on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. And we can spit that into um, stuff you can tell the patient to do. Yeah, the patient, the patient use of fluoride, and that's pretty much toothbrushing or mouth rinsing. Um, or we can think about stuff we can give them, and that's varnishes and gels, or I think you guys use foams as well. Um, and finally, we'll finish with the uh, treatment of the day, which is SDF, which is really, really, really becoming extremely popular. Okay, so toothbrushing and fluoride toothpaste. So I think at this point, it's important to acknowledge that when you look at the health gains in uh, dentistry in the last, let's say, quarter of a century, you know, half a century actually, it's probably all fluoride toothpaste. Uh, and, and I think as dentists, we'd love to believe that we're there treating patients and we're making everything better. The reality is the advent of easily available fluoride toothpaste is probably one of, probably, probably the single biggest health um, innovations anywhere, you know? So when we're thinking about fluoride use and fluoride prescription for our patients, fluoride toothpaste is the one to start with because it's easy to buy, it's easy to use, um, and it's easy to, to tweak how they use it to get the best out of it. It's also important to note, to remind everyone, that toothbrushing without fried toothpaste, yeah, physical removal of plaque on its own will not prevent caries, okay? So when we're talking about toothbrushing, we're really talking about, and caries, we're really talking about toothbrushing and fluoride toothpaste. And in young children, particularly the under fives, it's, I think it's more helpful to view toothbrushing purely as a mechanism of delivering fluoride toothpaste. Because the reality is, uh, young children are never gonna clean their teeth quite well, uh, that well. They have gingivitis and plaque, whatever you do, about half of them have gingivitis and plaque. In prepubescent children, poor oral hygiene will not cause periodontal disease. That doesn't happen until you get post-pubescent, okay? Um, and, and really, if you get too focused on the oral hygiene aspect, um, you can lose sight of the fluoride delivery aspect because sometimes you'll find little children will be very happy to put a brush in their mouth and do it themselves, but won't let mum or dad do it, okay? And in those circumstances, better that the child does it with the fluoride toothpaste. doesn't matter whether or not they do a good job of cleaning, um, as long as they get the fluoride toothpaste in, uh, rather than the parents try and do an immaculate cleaning job, but then fail because the child doesn't want to lose that control. And that's where, actually, I think you might have an interesting problem. Because, again, I, I thanked Hassan. I thanked Hassan again. Um, he passed this on to me. Uh, and, and this article was an article of oral hygiene practices among Saudi children. 
um, and its relation to their dental carry status. And so I, I've just highlighted one table here and actually I'm not interested in the plant score in this table because uh, as I've said, um, actually in little children, um, clearly oral hygiene is important and we want to get better at it, but actually whether or not they got plaque wi within reason doesn't really matter. But what is interesting to me here is the brushing frequency. So you've got 27% um, irregular and 31.5% uh, once. Okay, so more than half aren't doing a twice daily brush and you want that twice daily brush because not because of the plant removal, because it's that twice daily fluoride toothpaste delivery. The other interesting one that I really don't know uh, of what, 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 I, what, what I think about uh, is the use of miswak. Okay, now obviously that is not something that I, I'm familiar with, um, but clearly um, in your society, it, it's really common. Um, and my understanding is that it's possible to do reasonable oral hygiene plaque removal with MISWAC. That's fantastic. But what about the fluoride delivery? Uh, and that I don't know, and, and maybe somebody could enlighten me at the end, end of the talk. But um, if you're just using MISWAC to clean your teeth, how are you getting the fluoride from the toothpaste in there as well? And, and again, uh, I'm assuming you guys have already thought about this um, and hopefully someone could give me a, an answer on that. But I think this is an interesting, I thought it was very interesting with regards to um, uh, uh, issues that affect you, you, uh, your, your society in the broadest possible sense. So stuff patients can do, toothbrushing. Toothbrushing, toothbrushing, toothbrushing with fluoride toothpaste. And uh, we have a dedicated section in our history for, uh, for our students to fill in, for all our staff to fill in. Um, because you need to know how often a child's cleaning their teeth. You need to know how much toothpaste they're using. So under six, we tend to prefer a pea-sized, a grain of rice-sized, uh, um, or a smear. Uh, because that way you're limiting the amount of toothpaste. So if you're worried about fluorosis, it, it, it'll reduce that risk. Over six though, they can use a generous amount uh, as shown on the picture here. Um, concentration, fried concentration is really important. So for us, it would be minimum a thousand. Uh, for you, uh, if for the sake of argument, you had a two year old on 500 PPM and they were still getting caries, you might say, well, let's go up to a thousand PPM. Um, for us, if we had a two year old on a thousand PPM with caries, we put them up to 1400. If we had a 10 year old with caries, we put them up to 28. If we had a 16 year old who we were really worried about, we might put them up to 5,000. I think the important thing is to really understand what concentration of fluoride toothpaste your, uh, your patients are on. Because uh, um, from the patient's point of view, they just pick one up from the shelf and they don't know what's in it, you know? Um, and really, as the dentist, it's important for you to understand what the different brands are. So for us, the Public Health England um, document actually lists all the brands and gives the strengths. But before that was produced, what I used to do, what I used to tell our students was, you've got to go to the supermarket and you've got to pick all the brands up and you've got to work out what the strengths are because otherwise you can't really help your patients understand which is the best one to use. The other tip um, is it's important to advise patients to spit afterwards and not rinse their mouth with water. Pretty obvious if you've got fried toothpaste in your mouth and you rinse out, then um, you're going to lose all that fried toothpaste. And we know from the mode of action, it's better if it's there uh, all the time. Okay, so spitting is better than rinsing with water. Rinsing with mouth rinse is okay. Patients who don't like minty toothpastes, some special needs patients, some uh, patients with sensory deficits. Uh, you can get fruit flavored ones, but even that cannot be quite right. So uh, in the UK, we have something called Aura Nurse, and it's a uh, bland, unflavoured, no foaming paste, okay? Um, so I'm not sure if it's available uh, in your region. Um, I'm sure you can always send uh, some of our students that with a big suitcase and, and they can uh, hand it out. But that's, that's a good alternative. Okay, the next thing patients can do is fried mouth rinses. Um, evidence is great. I've got a nice cook review here. Um, supervised use of fluoride mouth rinses. Obviously, you have to have a child who can use it properly. Uh, so often you'll find that younger children under seven to six is, can't understand uh, the rinsing and the spitting. They're more likely to swallow it, which you don't want, but, but they definitely work. Um, they'll work right after toothbrushing. Um, anecdotally, though, um, we tend to say, if possible, 
do it at a separate, separate time to toothbrushing. Not always possible, but clearly, again, it supports this constant low um, uh, dose of fluoride that we want. But fluoride references certainly work, but they're, they're a good addition. Tablet drops are gone. Uh, I don't know if you guys use them anymore or not. It's really hard to justify them now. Uh, it is a, a method for um, systemic delivery. You're meant to swallow it, you know? Uh, and we kind of used to tell patients, well, chew it up and switch it around. What, why? Just use fluoride varnish. Uh, it's, it's just a better way of, of, of doing it. So I think, I think we'd probably say that we wouldn't use that um, anymore now. Okay, that's stuff patients can do. What about stuff that you can do? And the big one is fluoride varnish. Again, really good evidence base. Um, uh, Cochrane Review here, it's updated regularly. Um, they work. We tend to use Durofat fluoride varnish with lots of different um, uh, manufacturers. We tend to use 2.26% fluoride varnish. Uh, I think someone was saying, I think uh, Dr. Parrott was saying that you guys have got access to um, 5%, even better. Uh, two to four times a year, safe, really, really easy to use in the UK. Anyone can use it, you know, within reason. Uh, dentists um, can use it, hygienists, therapists can use it, and nurses can apply it as well. Works across the board, any age, particularly useful in very young children. Um, and it's a little bit of an old study I'm going to quote here from Wine Traub in 2006, but they used it in children at a mean age of 1.8. So if 1.8 was the mean age, you can imagine the range meant some of them were really quite young um, and you got significantly less caries over a two year period. Uh, and it's safe. So some, some people worry about the strength and that you're going to poison your children. But uh, we know, uh, and I'm going to take some data from Child Smell here because they, they use it a lot in community settings. So they've had to think about this. So we know that five milligrams per kilo body weight is what we would call a, a, a toxic dose. Um, a 0.25 mil uh, application of Durafat would equal 5.6 milligrams of fluoride. So unless your child is exactly a kilo in body weight, you're not in much uh, uh, um, risk of poisoning them. And obviously when you put the Durafat on, the varnish on, whatever make, uh, it sticks, you know? It doesn't sw swish off all in one go, it sticks and then it will dissolve away. So, that, so they're definitely safe. There is concern they might provoke asthma because they're usually some kind of base that evaporates off that could trigger an asthmatic attack. There's no fixed guidance, just be sensible. You know, if you've got a really poorly unwell child with asthma, don't use fluoride varnish, otherwise you're probably going to be okay. Um, in particular, Durafat, there's this risk of colophony, which is really rare allergy to something called colophony. Uh, don't use Durafat. Um, uh, there are lots of other brands on the market, so the, the option we can talk about is fluoride protect. You can use fluoride gels or fluoride foams. So I had fluoride gels when I was a child. I've got to say, I didn't like it very much. Um, my understanding is that foams are uh, a little bit nicer. Um, there's certainly evidence for gels, um, and I think foams. In the UK, we tend to use varnish because it's just more straightforward. Um, but but I, I, I think in some territories, fluoride varnish is quite expensive. So they prefer gels or foams, and that's fine. You know, uh, um, I think it's, it's, I think it's all good ways of, of delivering fluoride. And the final bit before I get on to SDF is fluoride varnish versus fluoride sealants, oh, sorry, versus fissure sealants. Um, and there is some debate as to whether or not it's worth doing sealants because varnish will do a similar job. Um, and in the Cochrane Review, they thought maybe there was a little bit of evidence for superiority of pit and fissure sealants. But uh, if you read around the topic, I think that can fade away a little bit if you're looking at community approaches. So if you're wanting to deliver uh, a community-based intervention, delivering a fissure sealant uh, intervention is really expensive because you need uh, lots of kit. You know, you've got a patch bond. Uh, if you're going to use bond, you've got to dry, blah, 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 blah. It's quite a complicated thing to deliver a sealant, whereas fluoride varnish um, is not complicated to deliver. So I think in a community setting, probably fluoride varnish wins. I wouldn't suggest, um, I don't think you'll see fluoride fissure sealant trials uh, or community interventions in the UK. Um, but uh, if you're not in a community setting, if you've got the patient in front of you, then I would certainly say um, just do the sealants because you're they're there and the varnish. But but yeah, uh, I think I think no one's quite sure if 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 there is that much difference between them. Okay, getting to the end now. 
And let's finish with silver diamine fluoride because this is now extraordinarily popular. And it's an ammonia solution of silver and fluoride ions. Been used around the world actually, probably for decades. You know, I think uh, places like China have been using it for a long time, but it's been rediscovered by the West. Um, and America has been using it for a little while. I'm not quite sure how much you're using it in Saudi. Uh, we've been using it at the Eastman for a couple of years. And now I think as part of our change uh, to manage the COVID-19 problem, I suspect you're gonna see UK-wide usage. It's gonna come into national guidance. And the thing about SDF is it prevents caries, but critically, critically, it arrests the caries, yeah, in a way that fluoride varnish doesn't do. 38% fluoride, usually annual or binary application. Um, and the reason I've picked this photo is this is the circumstance where SDF is a real win. Uh, this sort of anterior teeth with gross breakdown uh, of, of the enamel and dead team, still vital. Um, and to manage that, it's gonna be difficult. You know, it's either gonna be really big, extensive restorations, or it's gonna be taking them all out. Either way, they're gonna need sedation, or they're gonna need a GA, or they're going to be strapped down. None of it's going to be straightforward. And SDF, the win for SDF is that you paint it on these front teeth, you're done. You know, they are, they are locked down um, and they will not need any further management unless you want to maybe later think about improving the appearance. Okay, so that's where SDF um, it, it is a real benefit. How does it work? The fluoride promotes remin, in the word that fluoride does. Uh, the silver is antimicrobial, so it reduces biofilm formation. But importantly, you get this highly remineralized surface zone, lots of calcium and phosphate, and that gives this protective effect. So this thing about SDF is it's not just a preventive treatment, it's like a, a, it's, it's like a treatment treatment, yeah? It kind of straddles between, between both. You're not just preventing caries, you're stopping it, all right? The only real side effect is that it stains the decay black, okay? Frankly, it stains everything black, but in most cases that will fade away. Don't get it all clothes, but it stains the decay black. That's the one side effect that you have to discuss with patients. And I put a photo here, I think it's from the UCSF protocol, just to show a little bit of how um, the, the tooth will change color. Evidence is good. Carries research uh, review here, high quality, very effective at preventing um, dental disease. Uh, again, another review here, uh, again showing very effective at preventing um, dental decay. Okay. And uh, another paper here comparing it to fluoride varnish. Um, a little bit limited in terms of the number of papers they could get, but again, they felt that it, it seemed to give a little bit more of a protective effect than. Um, um, standard fluoride varnishes. So definitely good evidence base, yeah, and more evidence coming out all the time. In terms of placing it, you've got to give the patient a heads up, you know, uh, and essentially the heads up is the decay will go black. So you might want to think about consent and you need a good information sheet and, and increasingly there are more and more good examples of, of, of that out there. If you want to know how to place it, uh, if you Google UCSF protocol for uh, silver diamond fluoride, you get this really great paper that we're all using, that essentially is a complete toolkit. They give you the evidence, they tell you how to place it, they give you an example of your information sheet, the whole nine yards. And the whole way of placing it, I've listed there, but the short version is on the right hand side, is cover everything that you don't want to get stained, because if you spill it on clothing, for instance, then you're going to have to buy them some new clothes. Put Vaseline on the lips and gums, okay, so they don't get stained. If they do, that doesn't matter because that will go away, but better to try and avoid it. You want good head control so that you can control where you put it and then you dispense it carefully, okay? And so you probably only want a very small amount in a, in a Daffin's pot and you really want a drop precisely put on each two, all right? Indications are uncooperative patients, uh, active caries, critically where you want to avoid an AGP. And that's why, that's why I think the UK is gonna go from a country that had heard of SDF to a country that is using SDF within the space of the next six months, you know, because it, it, it avoids the AGP. Uh, and I think what we're viewing it is as, at the very least, it's a temporary fix. 
So every child that comes in, you SDF every, uh, every tooth that's affected, every primary tooth that's affected. Um, uh, and at the most, it might be permanent because at the most, it might keep these teeth locked down until they exfoliate, actually. Repeat every six months and you can fill over it. There's this idea that you can put a, um, a fill, you do like a sort of a, you do um, an SDF, maybe with a little bit of ART and, well, no, you do an SDF to, to um, arrest the caries and then you put a glass on them or something on top. What I perhaps haven't stressed is I'm talking about use of SDF in primary teeth, okay? Uh, permanent teeth, the evidence isn't quite there and I'm not sure we'd recommend that. But for primary teeth, I, I think it's, it's transformational. In the UK, we use Revastar. That's all we have available to us. You may have different manufacturers. Um, the problem with the Reva Star kit is that it's one dose, it's still mini capsules. And so if you've got access to a different supplier that has it in a jar, it's probably a little bit easier to use. All right, fine. Um, and that's about 40 minutes. So I'm done. Um, I think in summary, fluor fluoride is really critical. I don't see how you can prevent caries without starting with fluoride. So I think it's really, really important you understand how it works, what you're trying to achieve. I think it's all about the basics, you know, so there's no point worrying about fluoride varnish or, or fissure sealants or even fancy treatments if you've not got the basics down right, you know, and the basics are a fluoride toothpaste, ideally a thousand ppm at any age, twice a day, you know, and, and that might be difficult or complicated. And I think particularly in the current crisis, I think SDF has got really enormous potential as a way of, um, at the very least, keeping these patients on hold until a point where we can provide the treatment we are used to providing. But maybe, maybe SDF will allow us to uh, lock them down permanently until the teeth exfoliate. And a thank you, yeah, I, I think Hassan needs to be pleased with me because uh, I've name checked him about three times now, but he was helpful and he gave us papers. So. Thanks again to Hassan. Um, if anybody was his teacher or trainer or is sponsoring him, then, uh, then he, he's doing okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Ashley, for this informative um, talk and review of fluoride use and prevention. We have received many questions and I think uh, we would like to start uh, answering them one by one as they've been received. We have a question here that states that in Saudi Arabia, the um, uh, the concentration of fluoride in toothpaste for children is 500 parts per million. Um, so uh, the issue is this, does this prevent caries? Is there any studies that looked at less than 1,000 parts per million? No, no, so, so yes, yeah, so, so that, that there, are, there are quite a few reviews. I, I did a review years ago um, on, on this. Um, I think, so, if whoever it was, if they email me, I'll try and give them a more precise answer. Because I think it's a nice question. And I think I'd like to remind myself because lots of countries find 100 ppm. From, from memory, the, the evidence is it's kind of like a, a graph and the more the better up to a point. Mm -hmm. So I think 1000 ppm is better than 500, but, but 500 is better than 250, you know? So, so I, think, um, I think whoever it is, email me and I'll try and give you a better answer. Off the top of my head, I think a thousand's better, but 500 is not a disaster. Yeah. What I would say though is if your patient is on 500 ppm and they're getting dental decay, then they need to go up to a higher strength. Okay. But if, if, if they're caries free and they've got 500 ppm, for sure, I, I can't see, I think that's fine. Yeah. And the other question that continues on this how did the government in the UK move from the 500 part per million for children? Uh, yeah. 1,000 part per million recommendations. The, 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 it just, it just, they just made the recommendation and the whole thing was fascinating. So my PhD was um, sponsored by Colgate um, and at the time Colgate used to, they didn't call toothpaste low or high fluoride toothpaste, they said that they were not to six and six and up because they didn't want to give the, the feeling that, low, that high fluoride and low fluoride was some, somehow a, a problem. Um, and, and Colgate was always really worried about patients accusing them of giving their children fluorosis from toothpaste. And, and that's just, it's just gone, you know, uh, it's just not a problem anymore. And you kind of look back and think, well, why was it ever a problem? Um, so the only cases of fluorosis that I see, and I work in a referral center. So anyone with those problems is going to come to me are exclusively Somali refugees 
because they uh, usually have lived at some point when they've lived in Somalia in areas where the naturally occurring levels of fluoride are really high. We Systemic do water. not, yeah, yeah, we, we do not see it in our population. We've had a thousand ppm uh, standard for a long time now, you know, a, a, a long time now. So if it was going to be, you know, it's like a huge experiment. Uh, if it was going to be a problem, we would have seen it. So yeah, so no, it just it just kind of happened. I mean, I, I think I think I suppose the more precise answer is that the evidence from the reviews was that higher strengths were better, and that the risk of fluoridation was less. Yes. And so that was one of the choices made. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we have a question here. It says, are there special settings for school supervised toothbrushing programs? Can you please tell us on the challenges and ethical consideration? With the Ministry of Education, parental consent for use of uh, community or yeah. school programs. Yeah. So, 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 um, I think the best thing to do is to Google Child Smile, uh, basically, because I, I, Child Smile uh, do it all in Scotland. They have a large amount of resources. They can answer all of those questions. And I think if you are in a position to drive that kind of innovation in your own area, I'm sure if you talk to somebody at Child Smile, they'll be delighted to share that information with you. So, so I, 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 I'm not going to pretend that I could give more specific answer than that because um, I, the, I work in a hospital. They are the people to talk to. Uh, oh. And, and they, they are, they're, they're, I'm sure they'd be delighted to share that knowledge because they're very good at it now. And, you know? and it's on their website and everything. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 they've got, and they've got loads of resources. Fluoride varnish and supervised toothbrushing are really common. Child Smile, like I say, are the, are the kind of the big group that deliver it. But uh, where, I, where I work in London, our local a community um, dental service, they deliver it at schools. Um, and my understanding is that they just go to the school we're coming in. Parents are saying, do you want to, yes or no? Most parents say yes. And then they rock up with um, a hygienist and a chair and they kind of just slap it on. It's not, it's not rocket science, but, but go to Child Smile. They've got protocols, they've got everything. Child Smile, okay. So we have many questions, so we want to go quickly, uh, try to get as uh, many as we can. The we also forget Susan as well. <laughs> yeah, the 0.25 mil of Duracat having five milligram fluoride is this for the 2.26 percent or the five yeah it's for, it's, it's, for, it's for the 226 okay so if you're on, if you're on the five percent then i guess my maths i assume you double that either way even if you doubled it that would mean for a two kilo child you might be worried but children are not two kilos children are much larger than two kilos so i think the point is that you're the point of that slide is just to get across the fact that you are miles away from 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 risk uh, there is an interesting question here about dental flossing for children. How is it done? When is it recommended? Is it useful to do in children? Yeah, so, so um, uh, my personal view, don't shoot me, is that it's kind of a waste of time. <laughs> you know, I, 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 sort of, I sort of think in, so I think, so from puberty onwards, uh, because of the changes in hormones, etc., broadly, plaque leads to gingivitis, leads to periodontal disease, leads to bone loss. Yeah. So oral hygiene is critical, and flossing is part of that. Okay. Pre-puberty, you don't tend to get the, the bone loss. We never see periodontal disease in young children unless they've got a serious systemic problem. So, so it's less of a problem. So it's important, on the one hand, to train children to be functioning adults. And cleaning their teeth well but on the other hand it's important not to drive yourself crazy you know and and i would question the dexterity of a you know a six-year-old or five-year-old uh, of a ten-year-old to you know jesus even a 50-year-old to, to manage a floss so i think I, I think on the one hand you want to train children to be adults who are able to look after their oral hygiene on the other hand you've got to recognize what they're able to do so i think i think flossing for me i don't think the health benefits are probably worth it in children. For me, it's worth it just in the way of training them up to be competent adults, if that makes sense. Thank you very much. Um, do you think that soluble fluoride concentrations should be labeled on the box? On the box, um, it would certainly make everyone's life a lot easier and it would be better as well if it was labeled in a consistent way. So sometimes it's in parts per million, sometimes it's in percent. I, I, I struggle 
you know so so i think i think it's easier now in the uk because it's really hard to buy anything other than a thousand ppm so consumers can't go wrong but before we kind of made the shift and all the manufacturers reformulated yeah it was a nightmare you, you know if you're going to 250 or 500 and it's really hard to advise consumers as to which one to, to, to buy we have a couple of questions on STF, but I think I just want to combine them together. So maybe we can tackle this one. Is topical fluoride varnish application of any use when applied on already decayed incisors in a two years old? Does it's it all, have it's all, yeah. arresting effect? Yeah, yeah, no, no, it, it, it will. It's always worth applying fluoride varnish uh, twice yearly because it will prevent caries elsewhere and it will have an arresting effect. But from the evidence, it looks like SDF is better because it, it has this extra kind of, um, of, of dimension in terms of getting the, the caries to really stop. Uh, so, so but it's always worth applying fluoride varnish, you know, and, and I think if you've got a, a child that carries risk, if you look at Delivering Better Oral Health, the English documents, a child that carries risk, somebody who's had caries before, should be having fluoride varnish twice a year. And I think, I think that is what we would still do that. Um, I, I think SDF just seems to have this extra little bit. The fluoride bar is that. like a routine preventive. Um, yeah, management. yeah, it should just exactly it should just be built yeah. in. Yeah. Okay, so how does SDF treat a tooth carious lesion? Looks like radiographically after arresting the caries. Ah, the very good point. Um, I don't think it looks any different, but that's a really good question. I've not come across that before, so so I don't absolutely know. But I don't think it looks any different. But I don't absolutely know. But there's, there's, there's lots of, um, uh, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> to be honest. Right. We, we need to see the cases. Yeah, yeah, you know, so, so yeah, so I mean, it's, it's new for the UK, but it's going to be um, national guidance as of the next month or so. Uh, the difficulty in the UK is that the one manufacturer of SDF, their license is as a desensitizing agent, not as a carries preventive agent and that has given some uncertainty about its use but the it turns out that's not a problem so that, but, and i think we'll be using it like it's going out of fashion so I'll, ask me again in six months and i'll have all the insights Excellent. uh some are asking what instructions do you give to the patient after you apply stf i think normally it's a little bit like fluoride varnish don't eat or drink for i, I can't remember i think it's something like half an hour, something like that. Uh, again, if you go and download the UCSF protocol, that has all the information there. Uh, BSPD, the British version of SSPD, is putting up some uh, more resources on the website as well. Um, uh, so uh, all those sorts of details can be found quite easily. Okay. Um, one of the participants saying that he found STF also useful for MIH molars in cases of extraction option until the timing is ideal for extracting the sixes. That's a really nice point. Thank you. We've been talking about that ourselves. Um, and I know there's a service evaluation happening between four hospitals. So um, if whoever that was uh, wants to send Susan an email, um, she'll be interested as well. So very nice. Okay. Um, what about using fluoride varnish 2.5%, 11,300 parts per million versus 5% as the first one has better absorbent due, absorbent due to less viscosity, has less viscosity and better acceptance from, for children point of view? Yeah, no, no, uh, fine. Yeah, uh, that sounds very sensible to me. I, I think, I, think I, I don't get too much into different brands. We tend to use Durafat, which is 2.26%. Other places in the UK use Fluor Protector. There are other brands because they prefer them for different reasons. I, I, I mean, I'm not sure, I, I'm not aware that the evidence is there that I can tell you to use one or the other. But I think if, if an individual prefers one or the other, I think that's perfectly fine. I think uh, as long as you're around about the 2.26% mark, a bit higher, whatever, uh, I, think, I, think, I think you're good. Okay. There are a couple of questions about SDF again. Um, would you consider it as a permanent solution? The other comment here, shouldn't we restore it? Shouldn't we always restore after using SDF? So they kind of linked questions. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no. I think they're really good questions. Um, and I think you could answer them both with an affirmative yes you should restore yes you can you can leave it as a permanent i mean i think it's going to 
So if you look at how it's being used, particularly in Asia um, and in areas where they don't have the facilities to restore, it's permanent, okay? And there is evidence that it can be used as the final thing you do for that tooth. You put the SDF on and you keep applying the SDF and these teeth exfoliate and there are no problems. So I think the evidence is there, you can do it that way, okay? okay. Um, if you want to restore it or if your patient hates the staining and wants you to restore it, you could do that as well. You know, um, I, I, I don't think I can say one is better than the other. Um, and I suspect what will happen in the UK is that we will use it and some patients will say, you know what, I'm fine with this, um, leave me alone. And others will say, no, 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 I, I want something done. So I think, I think the most interesting insight I've had on this is from one of our former students, uh, Rashid Tahir, who works in Singapore. And so he works in a private practice. And so he's used to um, having to place uh, new smile crowns, et cetera, You're doing more aesthetic work than we do in the UK. We don't tend to do so much of that. But he has found that his patients who might otherwise demand a more aesthetic smile are happy to have SDF placed because it just makes the child's life so much easier. So I think I've answered that by saying everyone's right, but, but I, I think there's a spectrum of, of answers. We're having a few questions about the roses. Um, I'll just mention a couple here. Um, what would you do if a toxic dose was ingested? Are there any biomarkers for fluorosis? And what, is investi what are the investigations that could be done? For yeah, so, so toxic dose ingested. So that's a really interesting one. Um, if, if I was worried, I'd tell them to drink some milk and go to the hospital, okay? And I used to, so I've taught this for years now, and I used to give the patients a really complicated, I used to give students a really complicated algorithm where you'd say, well, you'd look at the patient's weight and then you'd look at what fluoride they had and all this kind of stuff. And then one of my friends phoned me up and said, well, my daughter's just had um, two thirds of tube of toothpaste, what should I do? And so my first question was, well, how heavy is she? And he had no clue how heavy she was. And then I said, well, what strength of the toothpaste? And he had no clue what strength of the toothpaste was. And I realized that, of course, that that's gonna happen every time. You know, I couldn't tell you how heavy my kids are. I have no idea, but I know what strength of the toothpaste is, but um, I, you know, it's really hard to, to string all that together. So I think if you're worried, you tell them to drink milk because that will bind the fluoride and to go and see A&E. The reality is that I am not aware, I have never found one single case in the literature of somebody who has poisoned themselves from fluoride from a dental source, okay? In terms of biomarkers, uh, I'm not sure I know. What was the last question? Uh, biomarkers. Yeah, no, so I mean biomarkers, I think you can, people talk about chronic exposure to things like fingernails and hair. I, I guess you could look in the blood, um, um, but I, I, I think that's probably the answer I can give on that. And was there another question to follow on from that? Investigation of their sclerosis. Um, investigation of what fluorosis. What would you do? Yeah. So, so if there is fluorosis, so to investigate, it's got a really typical appearance, this kind of papery whiteness. Um, and the difficulty uh, actually for us is distinguishing between fluorosis and amelogenesis imperfecta. Um, that, that's the complicated one because we see patients who we think have got fluorosis and then you'll have a family member come in um, who has not had the same exposure and has got a similar appearance. Um, so in terms of trying to diagnose fluorosis, um, like I say, papery paper whiteness, maybe a clear history of um, excess fluoride exposure. Uh, and for us, that tends to be Somali uh, migrants. Um, that's the group we tend to see. Um, and then you can look at the teeth to distinguish between a fluorosis and an AI. In an AI, you might see more wear of the posterior molars because notionally the, the enamel is not quite the same quality. In an AI, you might see torodontism. So, so it's those sorts of things. But well, the interesting we... thing, what, sorry, one more thing. The interesting thing is I say that our Somalis have fluorosis. We have got some Somali families with AI. So now we're just thinking, we don't know what the hell's going on, you know, because we're not quite sure what the problem is. Anyway, I know. Well, thank you very much. We have tons of questions, but I don't think we can cover it all for the uh, time uh, limits that we have. And we'd like to move on with our uh, second distinguished speaker. I will leave the mic to um, Dr. Huda Abdelatif. Uh, please, the mic is all yours.
Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for Dr. Paul for his uh, very informative uh, lectures. And I would like to welcome again everyone who joined us today uh, webinar. Uh, and before starting this session, introducing our speakers, our next speaker, I just like to remind you that after the sessions, uh, you know, there be uh, Dr. Uh, Susan Parekh will answer your questions. So please post your questions on the QA. Um, uh, Dr. Susan uh, Parekh will talk today uh, about anomalies of enamel and dentine. Uh, Dr. Susan Parekh is a very qualified uh, person who obtained several degrees after her bachelor in dental science. She got her PhD master and then a master in clinical dentistry. Uh, she had her MFDS, and she got the MP uh, from Edinburgh, and she got her FDS uh, in, of the Royal College of Surgeons, and she's a fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Uh, Dr. Susan Parekh, in addition to her current position appointment as a senior lecturer consultant in pediatric dentistry at UCLA and UCL, Eastmont uh, Dental Institute and UCLH NHS Trust. She's also program director of the Master in the Dent, uh, Dent in Pediatric Density at UCL. Uh, she's a chair of the Clinical Excellence Network in uh, AI and DI, and she is a member of SAC in Pediatric. For research, Dr. Susan Parekh is focused on multidisciplinary care and qualitative research for dental anomalies and pain management in children. Please welcome Dr. Susan Parekh. Thank you, Dr. Huda. Thank you for that. And thank you for this uh, wonderful uh, invitation. I'm so impressed at the number of participants who have turned up on a Wednesday evening after work to come and listen to us speak. So this is fantastic. Almost. So well, Paul had a... 1200 i know i'm so impressed really that's yeah. dedication it's really fantastic it's and i think it's yeah it's absolutely it's very well known speakers and this is a good opportunity for everybody so yeah well. no no but fantastic and i think all special pediatric specialty societies should be thinking of doing similar because this is really fantastic so Paul has done a fantastic talk talking about uh, fluoride prevention. I'm going to move on and talk to a slightly different topic, thinking about anomalies of enamel and dentine. And what we'll talk about here are a few different things. I'm going to start off by focusing on how enamel can be affected. And I'm really keen to try and get across to you the difference between what is enamel hypoplasia and hypomineralization. You could see it as my mission to try and make sure that everyone can tell the difference. And I'll try and explain to you why it's so important. Then we're gonna go on and think about, well, if you have got an animal defect, then we want to work out, well, how did that happen? Is it an inherited condition or has it been acquired? And we'll go through some different cases. And then we'll finish off with enamel with thinking about what are the different management approaches. And this is where it's really important where you need to know the difference between hyperplastic and hypermineralized because it will affect your management. And then I'll move on and discuss a little bit about dentine. I'm going to talk about uh, osteogenesis imperfecta OI, uh, and that can happen with uh, dentinogenesis imperfecta DI, or you can get DI on its own, you can get OI on its own. And one thing I found that students sort of over the years have sometimes struggled with is how to distinguish between AI, aminogenesis imperfecta, and DI, dentinogenesis imperfecta. So hopefully I'll give you some tips to see that you can tell those apart. And then lastly, I'll cover a little bit about how we're going to manage DI. So let's start off first thinking about what is the difference between enamel hypoplasia and enamel hypomineralization. And I'm afraid to be able to answer that one, we're going to need to go back, back to our dental anatomy days. And I'm afraid in my case, that's quite a long time ago, but it's so key to understanding how a tooth develops, how our enamel develops so that we can understand what has gone wrong. And when we think about enamel development, we're really thinking about three stages here. It's the initial formation stage, which is where we deposit our matrix. And then we have our mineralization stages that we break down into calcification and maturation. And then what I'm gonna do now is just go through these in a little bit more detail, starting off with formation. So this is the first stage of how any uh, tooth enamel develops. And what you do is you have this organic matrix that's laid down. This is a stage where the shape and the size and the type of tooth is determined. And it's the same across all different patterns of teeth. So for anterior teeth, it would start at the incisal edge. 
and for the posterior teeth, the molars, it will start on the cusp tip. And it follows the same pattern. It starts on the mesial buccal cusp, and then the last cusp to start to um, form and mineralize will be the distopalatal or distolingual. So that's why, for example, if you have a patient with MIH and you look, you've got different cusps that might be affected on different teeth because it depends at what stage of their mineralization it was affected. But I think what's key to get across here that hy um, hypoplasia, well, when we talk about enamel hypoplasia, we're talking about deficiency in the enamel matrix. So this is a quantity defect. There isn't enough enamel matrix, and that's where the problem is. And so what happens is because the enamel matrix doesn't, isn't laid down properly, there's not enough of it, the enamel is not of its normal thickness. And so teeth can look small, they can look thin, and they can look abnormally shaped. Okay? And one of the most common causes, certainly that I see, of, of a hyperplastic enamel is a type of chronological enamel hyperplasia that I see due to vitamin D deficiency, rickets, and I'm going to talk a bit about that later. So that's the first stage. So the enamel matrix is laid down and it's organic. Then becomes the stage where that organic material is removed out the tooth and replaced with um, our hydroxyapatite crystals. And this happens, this mineralization process happens over two stages. The first stage is calcification, and then the next stage is maturation. So what happens is stage two, calcification. So now we've got the matrix laid down, so size and shape has been determined. Now it's about determining color and hardness of the enamel. This is where we're kind of starting to put the processes down to make the enamel that we recognize. So now we're looking at a quality defect. So hypoplasia was a quantity defect, but hypomineralization is a quality defect. The enamel quality is poor. And if it happens in the calcification stages, this is right at the beginning of mineralization. This is about the first third of mineralization spent on calcification. And this is where the majority of the enamel protein is removed from the matrix and replaced with hydroxy. So if it happens at this stage, it's going to have a really big effect. You're going to have a tooth that's a normal size and shape because the matrix was laid down properly, but it's very discolored. It's very soft enamel. You could scrape it away with a sharp excavator if you had a sharp excavator. And so it's really easy for it to chip and break off. These teeth, because it's right at the beginning of mineralization, this calcification stage, we call these, if you look at the picture down here at the bottom, so these teeth look the right size and shape, but they're very discolored. They're sort of very yellowy brown. They stain very quickly. And more importantly, they're very, very sensitive. You imagine this enamel is very porous. So eating, drinking, very uncomfortable. And it's really common to see patients coming with lots of calculus because it's so difficult to brush their teeth. Whereas if it happens a bit later, after that calcification stage, it's still mineralization. It's still a quality defect. But now we're in what we call the maturation stage. And actually, this is a bit that takes about two thirds of the total mineralization time. This is where we're doing the fine tuning. So we've got the enamel laid down. We're starting to mineralize it, but now we want to make it as hard and as translucent and as nice as we know our enamel to be. So again, teeth are the right size and shape, but they're still discolored. In this case, discoloration doesn't tend to be quite so bad. It's more sort of white, creamish, yellowish rather than brown. But don't underestimate and think that because it's not as discolored, the patients are not as bothered. The patient that you can see in the image here was extremely bothered by the appearance of those sort of opacities there. So again, it's don't take it for granted that just because we think the color doesn't look as bad, the patient will be happy. Again, because it's a hypomineralization defect, it's a quality defect, this enamel was still weaker than it should be, and it will flake and chip off. And what we call this is post-eruptive breakdown. So when the tooth erupted into the mouth, the enamel shape and size is fine, but because it's weaker, it's breaking off. And I'm sure you're all familiar, the most common cause of this type of hypomineralization is molar incisor hypomineralization. Um, but I know from Hassan, who's already been getting to quite a few mentions, but he said that you had an excellent talk on NIH by one of your previous speakers. So you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to be going into that anymore. So a common question I get asked by my students is, well, but how can I tell if it's hyperplasia or post-eruptive breakdown? The tooth, the enamel is missing. I'm not sure. 
Well, you can kind of tell sometimes, but you need to start looking for some clues. So if we look at this top image here, we can see a very badly broken down uh, um, molar tooth, and I think that was the upper left six. Very badly broken down. It's quite difficult to tell, you know, was that tooth post-eruptive breakdown or did it just form that way? Is it hypoplasia? So we can look for some clues and really we're looking for colour clues. So I might be looking at the colour around the tooth if there's still some enamel. Does it look a little bit discoloured, suggesting there's a hypomineralization defect? Or I can look around in the rest of the mouth. And this is the same patient and that was their lower, left, lower right six. And you can clearly see the areas of hypomineralization, the sort of white and yellowish areas. So I'm more confident to say, I think in this case, this is a hypomineralization defect and now we've had post eruptive breakdown. So again, when you're not clear, which one of the two, is it hypoplasia, is it hypomineralization or post eruptive breakdown, look around in the mouth for clues and color is really the giveaway. The other thing that sometimes can help you is if it looks like very atypical pattern. So we look at this tooth on the top, that's not necessarily the normal sort of caries type of um, cavity that we would expect. So again, that might give you a clue that here we're looking for some post eruptive breakdown. So hopefully I've managed to convince you that, you know, when it comes to enamel defects, it's really important to be able to distinguish between hypoplasia, which is deficient matrix, or hypomineralization is where there is poor mineralization of the matrix. And again, remember, we split hypomineralization into calcification or maturation, depending on the stage that it happened. Now, the reality is, if you're not sure which one it is, just say hypomineralized, because you're going to make sure you cover all the right bases. It's just if you're wanting to be really clever in an exam situation, you want to show that you really know your enamel, that you might want to break it down further. Now that's great, but the reality is sometimes you can get both just to make our lives a bit more complicated. It could be hypoplastic and hypomineralized, as it is in this top image here of the upper left one. And so there's lots of weird and wonderful ways that enamel can be affected. It can be affected locally, like the top picture, where it's just that one tooth. So I'm going to be thinking, hmm, what could have happened to that tooth or its predecessor to make that happen? Or it could be something like the bottom image here, where this is clearly a more generalized defect because it seems to be affecting every tooth. And so for, to be able to tell what enamel defect I'm looking at, that's when I'm going to really need an accurate diagnosis. And so moving on now, next part of the talk, we're going to think about well, how do we tell? How do we tell if this is an acquired or an inherited condition? And so for me, really, it comes down to usually about five key questions that I need to ask. And so I'm going to break them down to you and think about, well, what are they telling me? What clues are they giving me? And if we look at the first couple, we're wanting to know, does anyone else in the family have anything like this? Now, clearly, if they say yes, then this is probably quite a big clue to tell you that you're looking at probably an inherited condition. Yeah. And then you might want to find out, well, who in the family has something like this? And you might want to draw a family tree. I get lots of fun doing these uh, on the clinic. Uh, so those are sort of things that you can ask. And I'm sure sometimes my parents wonder why I'm asking about grandparents and aunts and cousins. But it's again, I'm just trying to get an idea of inheritance pattern. But it's really important to know that if you're looking at something like AI, immunogenesis infector, sometimes it's a brand new mutation and there isn't a family history. So just because it, you're getting a negative finding doesn't mean you can necessarily rule out AI. But what is helpful then is, are all the teeth affected in a similar manner? Is this a generalized defect I'm looking at or is this just a localized defect? Because if it's a localized defect, then I need to be asking questions like, well, is there a history of trauma to the primary tooth or maybe infection? And that might explain what I'm seeing. Whereas if it's more generalized, then I've got to be thinking, well, this must be something either inherited or it may be something acquired, but it must have taken a long time to affect that many teeth. So just those couple of questions, I'm already starting to get quite a good picture about my patient and family. So if we think about those most common inherited condition that affects enamel, we're looking at amenogenesis imperfect or AI for short. And I like this definition, it's fairly short and to the point, it's a hereditary condition that affects the quality and the quantity of the enamel. Yeah? So it's either affecting quality and quantity or both, but something is happening to the enamel. There's a huge prevalence across the world from about one in 700 to Sweden to one in 40,000 US. 
we don't know, we've never done a prevalence for the UK, but I feel that we're probably somewhere in the middle. I think what I love about AI is it's so varied clinically. You know, it looks it's so different from one person to the next in families, even in an individual, it can look different from one tooth to the next. So that's what makes it fun and challenging. I think what's really important is it's worth noting, even though this is an inherited condition, primary teeth are not always clinically affected. And that can throw people because they kind of think, well, the primary teeth are fine and the permanent teeth are all affected, but it can't be AI. Well, the reality is just to make it a bit more interesting for us, sometimes primary teeth may not look clinically affected. They probably are if we looked at the histology, but they appear to be fine. And it only for some reason seems to manifest more in a permanent dentition. Okay. So if you see a child and they've got a generalized condition, there's a family history, but primary teeth seem fine, again, you can't necessarily rule out AI. There's also other features and little clues that might help you if it's AI. So we know up to about 50% of them will have a patients will have a skeletal open bite. So that could be quite a good clue. Things like Paul was saying, sometimes you'll find that they have torodontism on an x-ray, so very large pulp spaces, and that can also be a clue. And also they can be associated with syndromes. So things like cone rod dystrophy, Gillini syndrome, again, will have that. So when I looked to see, um, and this was a paper again that um, Hassan very kindly sent for us, he was doing a lot of work for us uh, for this talk, Hassan. But uh, he, he um, looked at, the, sent me this looking at prevalences in Saudi Arabia. And so when I looked, I could see, well, actually AI and DI are really quite rare, certainly in this cohort from this paper. This is from 2016, so less than 1%. But I'm sure that a lot of you, if you're specialists or seeing a lot of getting referrals, you're more likely to see these patients than anyone else. And then when we talk about sort of AI, there are so many different ways that they're classified, lots of different types. I like to keep things simple. Think about the four main types, which are the hyperplastic, hypermature, hypercalcified, and then the mixed. And that kind of helps you to sort of group them all together in their subgroups within. And then I think because this is a genetic inherited condition, we know that there are genes associated and there are quite a lot. But I've kind of listed here the sort of seven key genes that I think that we need to be aware of when it comes to AI. Um, the majority are sort of Amalex or MN, but there are other ones being found. And I don't know what it's like here in Saudi Arabia, but certainly for us uh, in London, at least, I mean, we aren't able to offer genetic testing routinely for our patients. So it can be very frustrating when I don't have a proper uh, family history. And I think I've got AI, but I can't say for certain because I don't have a, a genetic test. But I do know that there are certain phenotypes, clinical appearances of AI, that strongly suggest what the underlying uh, genotype would be. And a really good example of that is this last one here, the last gene number seven, FAM20A. And this has a really characteristic appearance um, clinically, where you get enamel hypoplasia, generalized, you have gingival hyperplasia, so very large in, um, gingivae and teeth that really struggle to get through. And so here's an example of a patient with FAM20A. So we've got these hyperplastic teeth, very thin, small teeth, big spaces between the teeth. And in the gum, you can see certainly around the anterior teeth, very large and well. So this is very difficult for these teeth to come through. So this would be the case where ideally in the future, it would be great to be able to say, actually, we don't need to do a genetic test. We know what the gene is. But for so many, we don't. And that's where ideally genetic testing would definitely be, I feel, the way forward for AI. But just to show you, look at the variety. This is another case of AI. Here we have some generalized defect, clearly affecting all teeth, but slightly different on some than others. But here, the teeth definitely look the right size and shape. So this is a hypomineralization defect. And if we look closely, actually the teeth look kind of whitey, chalky in appearance. So it's a hypomature type of defect. But again, that's what I think AI is so interesting because it's such a variety of different types. So those are the first key questions. That's where I'm trying to work out, am I looking at a patient with AI? If not, then I want to look and see, well, is there a chronological distribution to what I'm seeing? Is there a pattern? And if there is a pattern, then I want to start asking a few more questions. Is there something significant that could have happened in this child's first few years that might suggest a cause, depending on where I'm seeing this pattern? Older in size or hypermineralization, MIH, we really want to ask about the first two or three years of life because we know that that's when the teeth affected are starting to form. 
And then as Paul has quite nicely gone through, I do also want to ask about fluoride history if I'm thinking this could be a potential fluorosis. But really, when I'm starting to think about chronological um, distribution and these sort of things, this is where I really need to know my dental development dates so that I can start to look clever and work out what's going on. If you're anything like me, I found it really difficult to learn all my dental development dates. I used to learn them for an exam and then I would have to have the table on the wall, memorize it before the exam, and then it was gone. And I think for me, what really has helped is this atlas of development and eruption. And this is the one that's been done by Dr. Al Katani uh, in conjunction with Helen Liversidge at Queen Mary. I think this is fantastic. If you're not familiar with it, if you just Google it, you'll see this um, chart. And I definitely have this on my desktop um, at work. And what I really like is it starts from the corner of the arrow is what's happening 30 weeks in utero. And then you just follow it round and hopefully you'll be able to see my little mouse as we go through. And here at birth, I can see now which teeth are starting to mineralize. And then by about 4.5 months, I can start to see that actually the upper permanent central incisor and the first permanent molar are starting to look. So now I can get a bit clever. So if I have this patient who appears here to me and I can see, well, okay, so it's about, about half of the incisors seem to be affected, but it's not the whole incisor because I can see the gingival half enamel seems to be normal. So now I can look at my chart and I can see, oh, okay, something happened. It's around a year and a half to two and a half. So something around two years of age up until that point was disturbing the enamel. So now I can ask more pointed questions. Was there anything going on around that time? So it helps me rather than just vaguely saying, was your child unwell when they were younger? Now I can say, but what about up to the age of one and a half or age of two, what was happening? And then I'm more likely to get an answer. And I think what's really interesting is always noting that by two and a half years of age, you've also got the canine tips being affected. So again, this is not a talk about MIH, but you'll know that so many patients with MIH presenting where the canines or sometimes even the tips of the sevens may be affected. And the reason for that is because these are T4 developing at that time. So again, I think this atlas is really nice at describing that. Now this patient, came to us and they were had vitamin d deficiency rickets uh, and like i say remember earlier i was saying this is one of the most common causes for having uh, dental uh, chronological hyperplasia so what is rickets well rickets was very quaintly known as the english disease uh, for those of you who spent quite a lot of time in england with us you'll know that it's due to our wonderful weather uh, of which it's lovely and raining outside at the moment but basically vitamin d it, rickets is caused by a lack of sunlight we get most of our vitamin D through sunlight. We get some of it through dietary, but not usually enough. The majority of it comes through sunlight. And if you don't, you end up with this lack of vitamin D, so it doesn't um, get, um, take part of calcium uptake in the kidneys. And then you end up with an uh, effect on bone development. These children have bone pain, soft, weak bones. They have bony deformities, and of which if they're younger, they get the sort of bow-legged appearance and they get delayed walking. So whilst our medical colleagues are really familiar with the issues to bones, they're not usually so aware that there may be enamel defects as well. Okay. In the UK, like I say, because of our wonderful weather, we usually recommended that children over the age of one should have vitamin D supplements. And I think what's really important is that once you give these supplements and the vitamin D levels are corrected, bone and the enamel formation goes back to normal. So that's why we see that sort of appearance we did in the last slide where you have an area of defective enamel, and then it goes back to normal. And what about Saudi Arabia? I mean, surely you can't have an issue with vitamin D deficiency. You've got water or sunshine. Actually, this is interesting. So these are a couple of papers I found from last year, and they were saying that actually vitamin D deficiency is a problem here in Saudi Arabia for you, and that's uh, even men and women and children. And I think the reason for that is not because you don't have enough sunshine, I think you have plenty, but actually it's probably, it's too hot. So people aren't out and about walking in the streets. You know, you're going from the air-conditioned car to the air-conditioned mall to the office to the home. And so you're not actually out and about um, getting the sun. So it's something that you need to be aware of here as well. I'm sure a lot of you have seen your patients with that, but I think it's about educating our medical colleagues to say, you know, we need to be aware of this because it has an impact on the teeth. 
lovely. So hopefully I've convinced you that there's a difference between hyperplasia and hyperimmunization. And now I'm going to say why that's important to work out so that we can think about different management options. And I think when we're thinking about management, let's not underestimate all the factors that we really need to think out for patients. You know, there's a lot of aesthetic demands. You know, children are becoming more and more aware of their teeth at a younger age and wanting aesthetic solutions younger and younger. So we need to be aware of that. When there are enamel defects, sensitivity can become a big issue. You know, brushing teeth and so on. And so we need to be able to offer advice for that and cover and protect teeth. There may be problems with tooth wear and function and there may be malocclusion. And all of these will have an impact on oral health quality of life. And certainly myself and one of my students a few years ago, we looked at the oral health quality of life in um, children with AI and it did have a significant impact. And so we really want to get the treatment right for these patients. So it's going to depend so much on the treatment type so that we can choose the right type for them. And if we think about hyperplastic enamel, remember this is where we had the reduced quantity of enamel. So tooth was smaller, thinner, abnormal shape. But it's really important to remember that what enamel they do have is usually well mineralized. So that means, firstly, it's not going to undergo post-structive breakdown because it's nice and strong, but also really importantly, we can bond to it. So this is where adhesive restorations are definitely going to be part of our um, armamentarium. And actually, what's even better is that it's almost like the prep has been done for us. So we don't need to drill any more enamel off or pre uh, prepare the tooth usually, we can add the composite on. We're still going to need to use local anesthetic because these teeth are sensitive. But if you see here on this example here, there's a patient with vitamin D deficiency rickets, very concerned about the appearance of front teeth and very sensitive. And these are ones that we just added composite directly freehand onto there. And there you can see really nice result. Patient, parent, delighted. Very straightforward. So hyperplastic enamel on the whole is usually more, I'm not saying more, but it's usually fairly straightforward. Here's a more challenging case, and this is one of our uh, form students, Shema, um, who did this uh, as her uh, presentation case. So here we've got a patient where, now this is clearly something generalized because it's affecting all of the teeth. And then this is probably a case where you've got not only hyperplastic enamel, the enamel is missing, but it's probably hypocalcified as well because it's very discolored, very brownish. So this is one of those mixed types, but a significant challenge. But um, this is where Shema really was using crown forms for most of these teeth to repair these teeth. And we had to accept that oral hygiene wasn't excellent, but we were never going to get excellent oral hygiene for this patient because the teeth were just too sensitive. So we started restoring with composite and knowing that you know the gingival um, health wasn't perfect, but it definitely improved after we covered the teeth and made it easier for the patient to brush. So that's hyperplastic enamel. Hypermineralized enamel is a different story. Because here, it's the quality it's reduced, but the tooth is a normal size and shape. So if we just try and stick composite on, it's going to become bulky. So we may have to then remove some enamel or some tooth tissue to put composite on. So that's what we really don't want to be doing because we've probably got a young child here. They're still growing and so on. But also we're worried about bonding. This is hypomineralized enamel. The bonding may, not, may be compromised. And so in this case, this is where we probably want to think about other alternatives to adhesive restorations. So we may consider, say, preformed metal crowns for the um, posterior molar teeth, and then using things like microabrasion, vital bleaching, or resin infiltration. And teeth. This is a case here that you can see a patient MIH very concerned about the appearance of the front teeth. And this is now after some microabrasion. Really straightforward treatment, huge improvement for the patient but actually very little destruction of the tooth, very minimally invasive. So this is definitely the sort of thing you want to be thinking of first for a hypomineralize. So that's why it's so important that we understand what type of enamel defect we're looking at so that we can get the right type of treatment. So in summary, when we think about enamel defects, remember they can be acquired, they can be inherited, they can be localized, they can be generalized. There's so much variety that we can choose of. And so to work out what we're looking at, we need to think about our careful history, asking those questions uh, to find the right cause. And then we need to understand this fundamental difference between hyperplasia and hypermineralization so that we can then choose the best management option and um, manage the care of the patient appropriately. Okay, so that was a whistle-stop tour through enamel 
um, defects. I'm now going to go on and talk a little bit about um, anomalies that affect dentine. And again, I could quite easily spend all day talking to you about that. And I'm pretty sure you don't want me to. I'm sure you want some dinner and go to bed. But I'm going to just talk a little bit about OI and DI. So for those of you not aware, OI, osteogenesis imperfecta, used to be known as brittle bone disease. And the reason for that is that the bone is very soft, breaks very easily, and it's due to defective um, collagen. And it's type 1 collagen that's the defective in this case. And it's fairly common, rare, one in 15,000 to one in 20,000 life births. I think, you know, I feel that probably at the Eastman, we feel like we see lots of patients with OI because we're linked to um, the Great Ormond Street, which is one of the specialist centers of OI in the country. And so they, we see all their children for screening. Now, a few years ago, it was really easy when it was when you talked about genetics of OI because it was always either COL1A1 or COL1A2. Those were two genes that had the mutation, autosomal dominant, really easy. But actually, in the last 10 years or so, with um, better sort of gene sequencing, we're now finding that there's a uh, more and more rare recessive types of OI that have also been found. And so we've gone from our previous classification, which was types one to four, uh, with one being type one being mild, uh, going through to type four. But now the latest classification, so I've put here 16 types. My student Jasmine informed me today there are now 19 types. They're finding new types all the time. So it's, it's increasing all the time as we get better at doing molecular sort of analysis of the genes. And what do these patients present with? Well, depending on what type and what severity of OI they have, they will have sort of bony deformities, they will have short limbs, they may be of short stature. Although actually that's become a lot less now because of bisphosphonates that have transformed the management of OI patients. But remember, this is a collagen defect, so it's not just bones, it's going to be uh, all their joints. So they have lax joints, hypermobility, they may have hearing issues. Later in life, they will have cardiovascular, respiratory concerns. So it's a full multi-system um, condition. And when you see patients with OI, a lot of them will have this sort of appearance where the, um, what we call here the blue sclera, where the eyes have this sort of bluish tinge to sclera. And that's because of the sort of defective collagen is reflecting the light differently of sclera. So again, these are features that you can see. And so while we're quite good at noticing those, we need to remember that some children with OI will also have dental uh, abnormalities. The most common of which that most of us will know about is DI or dentinogenesis imperfecta, but actually other abnormalities as well. So recent studies have shown that about 50% of children with OI will have other dental abnormalities. And that could be DI, but it could also be hypodontia, it could be impacted teeth, it could be enamel defects. So, I think it's so important that as this group of patients that they always get a dental screening because they will have other issues apart from just whether they have DI or not. So here's kind of nice clinical example, really typical sort of um, OI patient who's got DI. And what's so fascinating for me is if we look at the primary teeth down here at the bottom, very discolored, aren't they? You know, that really kind of reddish brownish discoloration, very worn. But if we look at the adult teeth develop, uh, that are um, erupting, so the incisors, sixes, they look fairly normal. And again, that's what I love about these sort of conditions. It's like, well, why is the same process of dentinogenesis to form both these dentitions? Why is one more affected than the other? And the answer is, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm really trying to get to the bottom of this, but there's such rare conditions that it's quite difficult to sort of do research on these. But we've certainly, with quite a few of my former colleagues from Saudi, we've been looking at this and trying to get to the bottom of what could be the cause. But I think what's nice is that for a lot of our OI patients, if they have DI in their primary teeth, we can normally tell the parents and the patient, actually your adult teeth may not be as affected. We don't know why but that would be the case. So that's good that we can hopefully say that to them. But that's when we've got osteogenesis imperfecta with dentinogenesis imperfecta. But other times you can get just dentinogenesis imperfecta. Yeah? So they don't have OI, they haven't got the bony effect, but just the teeth are affected. And if that is the case, then it's going to affect both dentitions. They're going to have it in their primary teeth, they're going to have it in their permanent teeth. Okay, so that's really important that we kind of prepare them. 
actually probably the parents are going to be a bit prepared already because this is an autosomal dominant trait always so one parent will be affected and so they will have an understanding of what the condition is and what they've had to go through and it's really distinctive that discoloration of these teeth and I hopefully I'll show, show you comparison between AI and DI and you'll see why they look different it's kind of bluey gray yellow reddy brown kind of tinge but what it is is because it's the underlying dentine that is discolored it shines through the translucent enamel and it gives a very different hue to when it's an AI discoloration. But because the underlying foundation of the tooth, the dent in the tooth is deficient, even though the enamel is normal, it, it doesn't have a strong foundation and it chips and breaks off. And then once it does, you expose this very soft underlying dentine, which tends to wear very quickly. It tends to wear without much pain, which is unusual because you would think, wow, that tooth has worn down. How is that not very sensitive and painful? And the reason for that is because the teeth tend to obliterate. So they will just, um, the pulp will slowly retreat as the tooth is wearing away. And so you don't get problems. Very rarely, I will have some children with DI and they will have um, pain, abscesses and problems. And the reason for that is that the, uh, the teeth are wearing so quickly, the dentine is so soft that it's wearing before the pulp can obliterate. And those are the cases where you may get some um, abscesses. But generally, most of our children with DI won't have pain. And that's because of pulp and obliteration. They also, if you look at the next ray, and I'll show you one in a bit, they have these really characteristic sort of bulbous crowns and narrow roots. But again, I think all these little clues hopefully will show to you how you can tell the difference between AI and DI. But here we've got this really classic picture of a patient primary dentition and here we've got this appearance of the AI. So you can already see we're starting to get a lot of wear of these teeth. So teeth that come through first are the ones that tend to wear the first. Yeah? And so whilst the enamel is normal, it's the underlying dentine that isn't and you, sh you see the shining through of this abnormal dentine which is giving its discoloration. Okay, so I promise you we're getting towards the end, but I want us to just focus on, like I say, these are a couple of things that always come up over the years in trying to help guide people. What is the difference between AI and DI? Well, they're both inherited conditions. They're both generalized. They both give you tooth discoloration. So you can see how it could be a little bit confusing, but there are some clues that we can look at to help us. One of the clues is, like I say, when we go back to genetics, remember I told you DI is always autosomal dominant. So you're always going to have one parent affected. Whereas in AI, much more varied in its inheritance. It could be autosoma dominant, it could be recessive, it could be X-linked, it could be absolutely sporadic, brand new mutation. But if you've got a parent with DI, then you're probably thinking, ah, this is what it could be. So that's one clue. The other clue is the colour. The colour is really different. It's, it's that shining of the underlying dentine through the enamel that's very different compared to AI. And hopefully on the next slide, I'll show you an example of that. Another clue, the tooth wear is different. The way that the teeth are wearing down is different when you've got a DI because you see they just wear across you horizontally. And like I say, it's the teeth that have erupted first that tend to wear down the quickest. One thing else, another clue that we can tell for difference is sensitivity, like I say, is usually not an issue for DI, but it's usually a big issue for AI. OK, so again, that can give us another clue. And then if we look at radiographs, again, they look different. So hopefully I'll convince you of that now. Here we've got two pictures there, and I hope all of the audience will be able to tell that this image here is a DI, whereas this image here is an AI. So here we can see quite clearly that we've got this discolored teeth, it's generalized, but it's sort of a different type of discoloration that's coming from the underlying uh, dentine. Whereas if we look at the image here, again generalized, again discolored, but it seems to be more on the surface of the enamel. And little clues, look at all the poor oral hygiene. So this is telling us that sensitivity is definitely an issue here. And again, if we look at the pattern of wear, so here's a tooth with a patient with DI, and you can see the amount of wear we're getting down. And again, those teeth that came through first are the ones that wear down the quickest. But, and then you can also see how nicely you've got obliteration of pulp. So there's no pain, no sensitivity from this patient. It's a wear and aesthetics issue. 
And then lastly, if we look at the X-ray, the one on the top here, the EPT is showing a patient with um, DI. So we have these characteristic sort of really bulbous sort of crowns, pulpal obliteration teeth that have erupted, but the teeth that are unerupted, you can see that they do have their pulps. It's not as if they never form. But once the teeth come into the mouth, then they start to obliterate quickly. And again, it's that defense mechanism of the body. Whereas down here at the bottom in this DBT, we have a hypoplastic AI. The teeth look quite different. Yeah, we've got no contrast between enamel and dentine. We can hardly see any enamel. And we've got these very little sort of spiky uh, appearance to the cusp to show us that there's enamel missing. Long roots, pulps normal, no obliteration problems. So again, these are all little clues that will help you to be able to tell the difference between a patient who has DI versus a patient that has AI. Lastly, I really am finishing soon, but I just wanted to sort of touch on some of the different management issues when we think about patients with DI. So remember, as in all management concerns, it really is about what is the patient concern? Is it aesthetics? Is it function? Is it both? But I think particularly when you're thinking about DI and also for AI, you know, these patients, patients are going to need lifelong care. So we've got to think about maintaining whatever tooth structure they've got, keep it, but also let's not exhaust them too early. Let's not do too much treatment at the beginning, put them off the dentist, and then they never want to go again. It's really important that we build up that good relationship because they are going to need dental care for the rest of their lives. So in a primary dentition, we really think minimal intervention. We may do composite strip crowns for those, but sometimes Again, bonding can be an issue. The dentine is, um, the enamel is normal, but it tends to flake off. And we know that bonding to dentine is not so good. And then posteriorly, we used to tend to do preform metal crowns. And then previously we do the conventional ones, but actually hall crowns have absolutely transformed how we manage our patients now in a primary dentition. Because instead of having to use local sedation or sometimes general anesthesia, we can put these hall crowns on, usually without any local, and they will protect those posterior uh, primary molars. And then it really helps us to build up confidence and keep them going for long term. So this is a really good solution. And then in the permanent dentition, well, you know, previously we always thought well, there's no point bleaching. A DI patients because it's in a dentine it won't work well actually we've got a couple of cases where we've tried it and it has worked to extent it will take longer you have to warn the parents patients that it's going to but it can help and actually sensitivity doesn't tend to be an issue but there are some where if the teeth tooth tissue is missing and it's worn down then we're looking at composite but we do find that you have this so patients coming back repeatedly with sort of a failure of the composite because of failure of the bond and again, because we know that aesthetic um, adhesive dentistry is more of a challenge, these are where we might consider preform metal crowns on the um, permanent molars to try um, and restore as much tooth as possible. But there are some cases where patients will come to us with so little uh, tooth tissue that really we've got nothing but overdentures. And I'll show you an example at the moment. So here's one of our patients who saw them earlier. Really wasn't happy with the appearance of the teeth, but it wasn't just the colour, it was also the look of the teeth. And so we did some bleaching for a while and that pretty much helped with some, but they really didn't like the look of the front teeth, felt they were really short, felt that they were really still darker. And then this is where another challenge comes with some of these anomalies. Well, what shade do you use? Because normally shade A1 looks really yellow in some of these cases. And so this is where you have to consider using some of the bleaching shades to really try and mask that discoloration. I mean, we personally felt this looked way too white and too big, but the patient was delighted. And so we carried on and did the rest of the teeth. But certainly bleaching helped to take away some of the underlying discoloration so that we didn't have to use as much composite. And here's another patient with DI uh, where we were using um, preform metal crowns. I think we were really mean. This is obviously an old one. We'd use metal on these on the premolars. I don't think we would want to put quite that much metal into a child's mouth now. And we would probably think about composite for those premolars. And then lastly, here's a patient who turned up age of nine, hadn't been really to a dentist before um, and was now concerned about aesthetics. But, you know, there's not a lot of tooth tissue there with the best will in the world, even the best bond and composite. You're really not going to be able to stick very much on. And so this is a case where we used overdentures. So we kept the teeth as they were because they're keeping roots. We've got the bone gives options for later. But it means that now we can at least uh, restore the smile restore vertical dimension and restore some function. 
So in conclusion, anomalies of enamel of dentine can be inherited, they can be acquired, or they can be idiopathic as we think most cases at the moment of um, MIHR. I think what's really important is don't underestimate psychological impact. I think we had this case where we would say to people, you know, you're a child, wait until you're an adult and then we'll fix them. Well, actually, they really do need to have something done while they're children because it can have a huge impact on their confidence. And what I find is that a lot of these really complex, particularly um, these sort of AIs and DIs, this is where multidisciplinary team really is useful, whether it's my orthodontist, if I'm wanting to move things around or later on with my adult restorative colleagues uh, for how we're going to manage these long term. And as Dr. Hodo explained, we, uh, we have set up a, a clinical excellence network or special interest group for AI DI in the UK because we're really keen to start to develop some national guidelines for how to manage these patients and also to do some collaborative research because they are quite rare conditions. Okay, so just some references here that we will have on the website that you can have a look at and also thank you there. So I'm going to sh stop sharing so that we can go through any yes. questions. Yes, there is plenty, several questions and thanks a lot for your very informative uh, presentation. And I want to voice the, everybody at the attendee, they think, they think it's a wonderful presentation and they thank you and they looking, and they ask if they can get their PDF present uh, uh, of your lectures. Okay, so we can share it yes. perhaps with the organizer yes. and you can, they can post it on the website. Okay, so, um, for the questions, I have here questions related to uh, how can you differentiate between fluorosis and AI? Oh, such a good question. And I think Paul touched on that. The reality is until we have genetic testing, you really won't be able to say definitively. Yeah. It's a, at the moment, it's a bit of detective work. It's either if I have a family history, so I need to go quite extended, grandparents, aunts, uncle, cousins, to try and see if I can find a genetic uh, component that way. Or I want to specifically ask about the water source at the time when the child was, um, these teeth were developing. So sometimes things that gives me clues. So for example, if, they, um, if the primary teeth and the sixes are affected, but the sevens are not affected, so second permanent molars, then that makes me think, well, actually, then it can't be a generalized inherited condition because otherwise the second permanent molar would also be affected therefore it must be something acquired and it may be fluorosis yeah so i'm looking at the pattern of the teeth and i'm looking at the type and the problem is that sometimes generally the fluorosis ones have that really sort of mottled appearance very chalky white with sort of brown areas but sometimes some of the ais look a little bit similar so it can be very difficult. And there are times where I have to say to my patients and parents, I cannot give you a definitive diagnosis right now because I'm either waiting for some more teeth to come through or I'm looking for clues like anything on the x-ray that's suggesting that even the unerupted teeth are affected. And if that's the case, then say for example, if it looks like the third permanent molars are affected, then that's telling me this must be probably AI because otherwise it wouldn't be fluorosis, yeah? Or if I can see things like torodontism on the X-ray, that might suggest that it, again, it's AI because I know there's an association. But to be definitively certain without genetic testing, it's not always possible. Okay, there is a couple of questions related to management. Uh, this is uh, Abir Shemi, I think Dr. Abir Shemi, you know her. Yeah, Hello, she's okay. asking. Yeah. Is asking a question about what about the, the management of a delay eruption of the six or some cases uh, impaction of AI patient and for how long do we need to wait before uh, it become too late? So really nice question Abir and I think Abir saw pa patients like this with us at the Eastman so it's so difficult to tell I mean I think my understanding now of the genetics is if I see a patient like the one I showed you with the FAM 20A where you have this very thick gingivae that the patient and the teeth really struggle to erupt properly and then they can start to even resorb while they're unerupted those are probably the cases where we need to intervene early and maybe think about exposing the teeth to try and bring them through you know? So I think the more we understand about the genetics of it, and we know that these are teeth that are always going to be affected, we may need to intervene earlier rather than watching and waiting to see if they will come through. Okay. 
Another question related to uh, the SDF, the sulfur diamine fluoride, do you, treat, you use it to treat the hypercalcified posterior teeth? Yeah, so again, this is really interesting because we, you know, we haven't really been using SDF very much routinely. And initially our thought was only thinking about caries, but it was some of our juniors who were sort of saying, well, actually, why don't we think about using it for sensitivity? That's what it was originally devised for as a desensitizing agent. So yes, we're definitely going to be start using it for posterior teeth, obviously not anteriorly because for permanent teeth, they're already discolored. The last thing you want to do is make them look even more discolored. But certainly for posterior teeth, say for MIH, um, poor prognosis sixes or other um, uh, hypomineralized type defects, yes, I think we should be starting to use it. And I think we're definitely looking at doing a, a case series on that. I have a question from Dr. Zahra Al-Mualim. She asks, say, some patient with severe AI suffer from failure of eruption of permanent teeth. From your experience with patient with AI, what do you think the prognosis of these cases? Well, uh, it's really difficult. And there are certainly some types of AI where, yes, you do have this issue of, um, so it's always difficult because you've got separately primary failure of eruption, which is an anomaly that um, is linked to a separate gene, or you can have cases of AI where they do have difficulty with the teeth erupting. Honestly, the reality is that probably the prognosis for both is not fantastic because trying to uncover them and anchorage and pull them in doesn't seem to work very much. So I think those are cases where, again, you probably want the multidisciplinary input to start thinking long term. You know, if we're going to lose these teeth, how are we going to manage those spaces and thinking about working them up towards ideally implants long term? They're very challenging, those patients. So Dr. Zara, I totally feel for you because there were some where you sort of scratching your head going, oh, my gosh, I don't know what to do. Um, but they, you know, they are a particular challenge. But I think that's where the really the multidisciplinary approach. Let's start thinking long term. At the moment, what are we going to do when that patient is 20, 30, 40? And then we start aiming towards there. Who should be the main, you know, in your, in your team that, you know, in, in, in multidisciplinary? That, well, that... clearly I'm going to say the pediatric dentist. <laughs> yes. Um, I, think, I think we are definitely the key uh, people in this because we will see them from the youngest age. You know, the average age of a child coming to see us with AI. We've done, um, one of our students, Sam, has done a um, an audit of this and it's about seven so we're seeing them from around the age of seven all the way through to about 16 17 18 sometimes a bit longer so we are going to really build up a relationship with this patient and his family and so we really do need to be that key person who will sort of coordinate everyone else i, I really feel strongly that this is where the pediatric dentist is the key person but i would say that <laughs> <laughs> you're not biased <laughs> no not at all <laughs> Would the patient would have uh, fluorosis and AI at the same time? Oh, gosh. I mean, it could, I guess. There's yes. I mean, you know, I, I think Paul puts it really nicely. You know, there were a whole group of families that we used to see from Somalia, and we used to take the history, and there was always families in that whole region used to have similar teeth, so we thought it was fluorosis. And then the family would move to the UK, and then younger siblings would start having the same appearance. So suddenly we're like, wow, maybe this is AI. And I think you could, you could be exceptionally unlucky and have AI gene in your family and be living in an area where there is naturally high fluoride. So it could happen. But most cases, it's usually one or the other. It's just trying to tease out which one. Okay. And another question, I don't know if you address it, how we, can we differentiate between the DI and the dentine dysplasia? Yeah, good question. I didn't get a chance to talk about dentine dysplasias. Like I say, I could have quite happily talked about anomalies for about a day, but the dentine dysplasias are very similar. And it actually, if you look at the more recent classifications, they are suggesting that certainly the type one dentine dysplasia is probably a form of DI. And I didn't go into it into this talk, but I think the whole classification for dentine um, defects, whether it's dentine dysplasia or DI, probably needs to be rewritten because they're all very similar. But absolutely, they can appear very similar. The type 2 dentine dysplasia is quite different. That's the one where the, there's no roots. So that's quite different. But otherwise, if you look at them clinically, yes, very similar. Okay, I have a question from Dr. Albatur Shinawi. She asks, uh, can resin infiltrate works well in, on AI cases? And is there any evidence to support the, the efficacy of that? 
Yeah, so very nice question there. Um, I would say that we are certainly looking at using resin infiltration. If you look at the literature on it, it seems to work um, better on the kind of diffuse white spots. The demarcated ones don't always work quite so well. We're actually trying it, uh, and we one of our students is presenting a case series at EAPD where we've done resin infiltration on both MIH cases and AI cases. So we are looking at it for both. I think the reason we're a little bit hesitant of diving in with resin infiltration first is if you do use it and then you want to decide later to bleach the teeth, it won't work because the resin infiltrate has now blocked the tubules so the bleaching won't work. So we have to think carefully about the order at which we do things. But I think definitely we are looking at it um, and it seems to be working better for the more sort of diffuse type opacities where you're trying to get a better light reflection. But I think definitely it's something to consider. Okay. So Albertul, good question. Uh, I'd ask about the overdenture that you, uh, how frequent you would change it from age nine years old? So it's just as the child grows. Yep, a little bit like shoes. How often do you need to change their shoes as they're growing? There we go. So same thing. You would end up having. We would have a that child a regular review, and as and when you know new teeth. Um, if if any more teeth come through, you might need to remake it, and then as they grow, you would remake it there. But it, there really wasn't any other option uh, in this case. Um, but again, you know, the parent had it. And so they knew what was going on and you just think, gosh, how have you managed to get to nine before a dentist has, you know, been able to see you and do something? So even in the UK where we think, yes, access to children, you know, to dentistry for children is free. It's not always easy and particularly access to specialist care for children with things like AIDI can be quite difficult on certain parts of the country. Okay, another related to treatment is bond strengths affected in both uh, hypoplastic and MIH cases? So, hypoplastic generally no, because even though the enamel is missing, what enamel they have is really um, fully mineralized. So, bonding is usually not an issue. And we certainly, from our student who Sam study, where we looked at cases of AI, we found that the hypoplastic AIs had less issues with failure of bond whereas the hypo mineralized will have an issue with bonding because the enamel hasn't mineralized properly so it doesn't bond as well so the more poorly mineralized the tooth the more likely that you're going to have a problem with bonding but it isn't a problem of hyperplastic okay there is a question related to the prevalence of the anomalies uh, do you, you know is there increasing there is some of the literature showing there is a little bit of uh, yeah i mean i think definitely things like mih are definitely increasing now whether it's just because we're getting better at spotting it mm -hmm. or whereas previously before it would have been masked with caries and that's why we wouldn't have noticed it mm -hmm. um but for me it feels like I'm swimming in anomalies because I see so many. I do a dedicated anomalies clinic, so that's all I see most of the time. So for, for me, it feels definitely as if the prevalence is, is increasing. But I do think things like MIH definitely. Now, whether that's something happening environmentally that seems to be, you know, causing more um, hyperimmunization defects in children, they've looked at so many different causes. We've not really pinned down what the possible cause of MIH is, but I do feel the prevalence is increasing. I have several questions, but let's take this as the last one. Is that any way to prevent okay. anomalies? Unless you can oh. you have time to, <laughs> to answer all the questions. But, uh, if only, if only we, yeah, I, I wish we could prevent anomalies. I mean, some of the things, the genetic, who knows in future, if they find a way of, you know, modifying genes so that that can be improved, great. But no, in most cases, if it's an inherited condition, it's a genetic defect. So there isn't really anything we can do about that. If it's an acquired problem, then yes. If we know, for example, that one child has had an issue with vitamin D deficiency, then let's make sure that the other children, the other siblings have also not got that problem. You know, So I think it's, if there's some things we can try and prevent more anomalies, but no, unfortunately, the inherited ones. I wish I had the magic wand, but I don't. Uh, thanks a lot. I have, as I said, there are several questions, but they can, they have your email and they can send exactly. you. Exactly. So you can. Yeah. yeah. I'll try my best to answer as soon as I can. Very busy time, but I will do my best. Yeah, but thank but, you. I really enjoyed this. 
thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Susan, for this very informative. And as I said, uh, all the floor are really thank you for this wonderful presentation. And I get back to Dr. Dania uh, Elagiri. Go ahead, Dr. Dania. Thank you very much, Dr. Rahodan. Thank you very much for our wonderful speakers, Professor Ashley and Dr. Uh, Parekh for their informative scientific contribution. I would also like, uh, I'm gonna share those slides. I'll see if I can share them now, share screen. Um, okay, so I, can, I don't know why I can't share my slides. Sh shall I do it for you? I've got it here. Can you do that? Yeah. There we go. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Prof. Ashley. My okay. Pleasure. Oh, yes. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our moderator, uh, Dr. Huda Abdel Nadif. Um, uh, and um, today's uh, webinar will be recorded and you can find it on our website and also on the YouTube channel. Also, if you browse your, our website, you'll be, uh, see updates on the upcoming webinars. And also you can um, join us as a member or renew your membership uh, through the web page. Next slide, please. Oh, hang on. There we are. Okay, this is just a token of our appreciation. Certificate of appreciation to both Prof. Ashley and Dr. Perek. And the next slide also our appreciation for Dr. Huda Abdelati for moderating the session. And uh, finally, the last slide, if you would pass, uh, pass this one, please, uh, Prof. Ashley. Let's oh, pass this one. Yes, here. So also I would like uh, to thank Knus Ritaj for uh, management, managing our event and communicating uh, this event free of charge. And of course, I uh, would like to uh, thank the board in um, the SSPD for arranging uh, these webinars and for all their time and effort in getting all these webinars uh, broadcasted and delivered to all of the attendees. Uh, last but not least, we would like to announce our next speaker, which is the slide before that, uh, Dr. Juan Gibbs from uh, the University of Indiana School of Dentistry, who will be joining us next week on Wednesday on a special topic on new frontiers in dental materials to use in pediatric dentistry. Thank you all for attending our webinar and hope that you enjoyed it and found it useful. And we look forward to seeing you all again next week, inshallah. Thank you very much and you all have a good evening.